This episode is brought to you by That Gosh Darn Hippie Show. Featuring music from the days of vinyl, it's the grooviest thing to hear on your radio. So, it has come to this. After years of scraping the bottom of the Christmas movie barrel, we have finally reached the most noxious residue clinging to the staves. The coal in the stocking, the nougat nut chew in the box of chocolates, the essence of seasonal depression made manifest in hideous CGI. Our next offender, Elf Bowling, the movie. While I wouldn't call the 1998 freeware game that ultimately spawned this aberration a classic by any means, it did have some of that same demented charm you find in Christmas at Ground Zero or Really Ugly Sweaters. But it wasn't enough to justify the parade of sequel games that followed, much less this 2007 assault on the eyes, ears, stomachs, and other sensitive body parts of anybody who watches it. And here in hell, we know the best thing to do with something so torturous is share it with the world. So let's examine the case of Elf Bowling. Like so many Christmas movies, this one promises to tell us the true story behind Santa Claus. For some reason, being a Turkish bishop never figures into these tales. This one involves pirates! Who pooped in the peanut barrel? Who pooped in the peanut barrel? Ah! Get used to that kind of thing, we'll be seeing much, much more of it as we go on. But for now, let's focus on the fact that this is some uniquely hideous animation. Everything about the appearance and movement of the characters is unnatural, ugly, and fundamentally wrong. With the possible exception of the Swan Princess sequels, I don't think I've ever seen anything this viscerally repulsive. So these particular pirates steal toys, which they then sell back to the kids they stole them from? I'm not sure if that's a phenomenally stupid idea or the most perfect example of late-stage capitalism in action. But the pirate captain, one Santa Maria Clausewitz Kringle, yes, really, has a bit of Gilbert and Sullivan-esque soft spot for orphans and gifts his share of the loot to the dear little tykes. Oh, and he also likes to bowl in his spare time. Santa, I refuse to dignify his full name by saying it more than once, gets accused of cheating at nine pins by his crew, and he tries to pin the blame on his shifty brother, Dingle Kringle. Three minutes in, and I hate this movie so much for that name. The brothers get into a fight, and the crew decides to take the smart route and chuck them both overboard, where they instantly freeze into pirate sickles and float toward the North Pole. <laughs> Whoa, 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 stop right there. We've barely passed the title sequence, and already this movie is an anachronistic mess. Now, regular visitors to my gallery will know that I tend to enjoy musicals that play around with setting and musical style, but the best of these have a theme or purpose behind their disparate elements. Dave Malloy didn't have Russian nobility dancing to electropop just for shiggles. He was deliberately emphasizing the mood of carelessness and abandon in the days before the French invaded Moscow. This movie just throws things in for no particular reason. Why does Santa need to be a pirate a thousand years before the golden age of piracy? No reason. Why have a snowboarding elf and a rapping elf and gangster penguins and a moai that speaks in 80s surfer dude lingo? No reason. It's just there. Snowboarding elf Lex discovers the ice pirates and uses a magic orb to thaw them out. Santa is of particular interest to Lex, as there's an elven prophecy that a white beard will come and lead the elves to... something or another. Since the elves have been making a whole bunch of toys, or doobel bobbins as they call them for no particular reason, with nothing to do with them other than store them in huge mountains, Lucifer knows they could use some kind of guidance. If I had me that mystic ball, I could steal every toy from here to Timbuktu. <laughs> Dude, have you ever heard of pieces of eight? Much easier to transport. So Dingle wants to steal the toys because evil, but Santa just wants to play along long enough to create a ship with Lex's magic orb and go after his mutinous crew because marginally less evil. And it's about this time we become aware of sin number three. 
Everybody in this movie is absolutely awful. I mean, sure, if you want to portray Santa as not all that nice, it's one thing. Any guy who spies on kids year-round and sneaks into their houses is bound to raise a couple of eyebrows. But every single character here is some combination of selfish, stupid, mean-spirited, or just plain irritating. Santa endears himself to the elves by accidentally introducing them to elf bowling, and the elves endear themselves to Santa by offering free room and board and a job where he only has to work one day a year, and also a hot elf named Griselda who makes a mean strudel. So Christmas is created, which should surprise a large contingent of the opposition, and there was much rejoicing. What are they doing? It's a surefire sign they like you, Whitebeard. That settles it. This movie was made by eight-year-olds, and not very clever ones at that. I have a rather low tolerance for vulgarity and humor, mostly because too many people mistake vulgarity for humor. It can be used in humor, and has been by many of the greats, but not as the beginning and end of the joke. Shakespeare used creative wordplay, Monty Python made the mythic ridiculous, George Carlin challenged our attitudes towards language and the absurd, arbitrary nature of censorship. Elf bowling is just crude and gross for the sake of being crude and gross, and it's incredible the amount of crap they try to get past the radar. In a movie theoretically aimed at kids, we have jokes about body shots. And then she meets up with this internet geek online and bada boom, she's left to Cancun for tequila and body shots. STDs. But I don't date without medical records. Just had me a checkup. And sexual assault in the workplace. Yeah, and what the bleep's happening? Huh, how come my underwear's on backwards? Santa is made an honorary elf complete with red and green wardrobe, and he's introduced to key members of his new staff. The rapping elf, Rapple Stiltskin. I can't decide if that's insulting on a racial level, a wordplay level, or just for existing. Candle, the entertainment director, and Bagger, packing expert and official union representative. Bagger gets to explain the conditions of the elves' contract in sin number five, Elves Better Be Happy. Because some people become different when money's involved. They can be real jerks or tyrants or just lame. Then what was once a pleasure becomes a total drag. And everything sucks and we can't do our work. And everything is miserable and terrible, unbearable and totally awful. Oh look, the movie's reviewing itself in song. Like pretty much everything else in this movie, this song is ungainly, unpleasant, and inexplicable, and alludes to the striking elves in the original video game without making it fit into the plot in any way whatsoever. No, no, you do not get to do a ha-ha Santa screwed up the end of the song joke when the rest of the song is screwed up already. Santa delivers toys through the centuries. No movie, you are not Mel Brooks and have not remotely earned the right to go there. While Dingle spends a few hundred years being a shiftless con. Eventually, Santa comes to love his gig, and hooking up with Griselda and her strudel is a nice bonus. But all is not well at the North Pole as the third millennium rolls around, as Dingle is perpetually crashing on Santa's couch and making the naughty list, and Bagger is badgering him with contract negotiations. We need snow cones on Thursday, cotton candies on Friday, <sighs> bubblegum breaks every 15 minutes and... Even worse, Griselda has had it up to here with her deadbeat brother-in-law and tells Santa that if he ever wants to get his hands on her strudel again, Dingle has got to go. So Santa gives his brother an eviction notice, and Dingle decides the only proper thing to do is take over Christmas. As one does. It's time to bring the fat man down. Because this time... Santa ain't coming to town! <laughs> Dingle's plot to do so is sin number six for its pointless convolution. To begin with, Dingle tries to drive a wedge between Santa and Lex by fiddling with the workshop books, so Lex gets blamed for an inventory shortfall. Because that's what every kid wants in a Christmas movie, right? Union negotiations and questionable bookkeeping. And it's all essentially pointless, as step two involves Dingle challenging Santa to a bowling duel with Christmas as the stakes. Hold on to your armpits, it's time for... Bowling for Christmas! 
Dingle, of course, plays dirty as he gets his hench penguins. Trust me, the fact that there are penguins at the North Pole is one of the least offensive things about this shitstorm, to take the place of the seven and ten elf pins and throw the game for him. It's an extremely obvious ruse that somehow nobody clues in on until Candle reveals it. Wait a minute! Dingle cheated! Dingle! Having failed to win Christmas at bowling, Dingle pauses to regroup, but first, villain song! I love a mutiny, backstab and betrayal, yeah, that's for me. There's nothing finer in the seven seas than a good old-fashioned mutiny. Yeah, sin number seven for that. I realize nobody's ever going to top the Grinch when it comes to the gold standard of holiday villain songs, but this mix of bland lyrics, bad singing, and boring visuals isn't even trying. So Dingle moves on to Plan C, discrediting Lex's reputation with Santa, which is basically more of Plan A. Is this an evil scheme or a rondo? But anyway, the henchwins sabotage the workshop machinery so it goes wonky when Lex is nearby, and Santa's false accusations infuriate Lex to the point of quitting. Well, you can't quit, cause you're fired! This leaves Dingle free to... I don't know what. Apart from the orb thing, I'm not even sure why Lex is supposed to be any more special or essential to Santa's enterprise than the rest of the elves. Whatever, Dingle lures Santa away by telling him Lex is stranded on an ice floe, declares himself the boss in Santa's absence, leaves behind a forged note to make it look like Santa abandoned the elves, and oh yeah, blows up the toy factory for good measure. That would have been really hard to plan for, but no matter... Dingle proposes relocating the whole Christmas operation somewhere warmer, namely Fiji, in what is probably the movie's most painful stretch, and that's saying a lot. Let's start with Dingle's pitch. Congratulations, you've just written a lyric that manages to be offensive on every conceivable level. This is some of the worst pseudo-Polynesian nonsense I've ever heard, and remember, I've heard this. She's sweet, dolly up a polly ollie. Sweet, sweet, dolly up a polly ollie. Lex is suspicious, but Santa is still MIA and Christmas is in two weeks, so Fiji it is. Luckily, the North Pole has a direct flight, which also contains a gold digger named Veronica, who joins forces with Dingle and generally contributes nothing to the film other than offering her island resort as a base of operations. The plane lands in Fiji, completely unaware that the country has an airport, where everyone is greeted by questionable indigenous stereotypes and a lot of generic island tropes. Fiji really rock a god on top of not your beach so nice. I didn't think it was possible, but these lyrics are getting worse. In fact, I'm pretty sure the only reason this part of the movie exists at all is because there was a tropical-themed elf bowling sequel. But anyway, Dingle persuades the elves to conga their way into a sweatshop, where he brainwashes them into becoming mindless toy-making drones. Honestly, it's not any worse than the training material they make you watch at Walmart. Back at the North Pole, Griselda finds the frozen Santa, thaws him out with a kiss, and gives him an inspirational speech that the movie seems to think he needs. Yes, it was meant to be. Whitebeard, giving the greatest gifts to children everywhere. Look, if Santa hasn't warmed to his true calling as a right jolly old elf in the past 14 centuries, I don't think anything happening here is going to change that. Regardless, Santa flies off after his wayward brother, leaving Griselda stranded to freeze or get eaten by polar bears, I guess. Meanwhile, Dingle is tying up loose ends by stealing Lex's magic sphere and blasting him out of the workshop and into Chief Stereotype's hut. Oh, hey, it turns out the magic was inside Lex all along. 
That is something that really came out of nowhere. But hey, at least we don't have to worry about Dingle using magic for... Oh, come on! Either the sphere is magic in and of itself, or it isn't. You cannot have it both ways. I know it's hard because it's so terrible, but try to pay attention to your own movie for more than two minutes. Lex finds Santa buried up to his neck by Dingle's surfer dude Moai, and they reconcile for reasons that are as vague and badly established as the reasons why there was a conflict between them to begin with. They break into the sweatshop, but with Christmas only a half hour away, they can't snap the elves out of their trance. Until Lex just leans against the reverse switch. Look! I'd call that a sin, but honestly, I just want the movie to be over. So go ahead, do whatever you need to in order to wrap this up. Listen up, you swabs! Dingle demands a rematch! I propose Santa and me bowl for Christmas again! Look, I know this movie is called Elf Bowling, and is based on a video game in which elf bowling occurs, so naturally elf bowling will be featured at some point. But you've already had one pointless bowling for Christmas scene in this movie, and you do not get away with repeating it. And yes, it is an exact fucking repeat of what we just saw a half hour ago. Lex and Rapple do the play-by-play, -play. again. And it's pitting brother against brother for the Christmas part. I mean bad. I mean fat. I mean box. I mean, well, you know what I mean. Dingle tries to cheat. Again. The fix is discovered just as it appears Santa lost. Again. Uh, Lex, I don't know what the bowling rule book says, but uh, looks like we may have missed the grease gun and the bomb. Which means Dingle cheated again, and Santa wins! So Dingle and his henchquins are rocketed out of the movie, Lex joins Santa on his delivery run, and uses his newly discovered magic to rebuild the elf workshop. And the phrase, let us never speak of this again, was heard throughout the North Pole, and everyone who witnessed this idiocy. yo ho, -ho and a bottle of... <clears throat> he means... Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night! I know we've seen some notable stinkers in this court recently, but Elf Bowling the movie plummets straight to the depths as one of the worst cases I've ever sat through. It's ugly, unfunny, disjointed, vulgar, inept, and insulting in its presumption that anyone would find anything remotely entertaining about it. It is the most uncomfortable and unpleasant holiday experience I can imagine, even considering the sheer amount of uncomfortable and unpleasant holiday experiences that get trotted out every year in the name of making a quick buck or misplaced family obligations. Obligation. So the court of musical hell condemns the producers and writers to an eternity of dinners with racist uncles. So let it be recorded. This session of the infernal court in musical hell is now adjourned, and good fucking riddance. <laughs>